I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome to the interview room, everybody. Time to take a seat. Thank you for all being here with us this evening. As always, coming to you from an undisclosed location. At TIR, we follow the evidence wherever it takes us on a case. We appreciate you being here. All parties are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. All opinions are welcomed here. We only ask that you keep them safe, classy, and honest. Thank you always to our mods, our Fab Four, Miss Sophia, Maui Girl, Mimi J2, Teresa M, always keeping things classy in the chat. We hope you follow their lead. We want to thank all of our members and our subscribers. With all of you, we move mountains of justice for families and for victims. We only ask one thing, that you subscribe to this channel and that you pass it around on your social media networks and hit that thumbs up. Tonight's show, the University of Idaho Homicides. Tonight's guest, my friend, FBI BAU profiler and executive director of the Cold Case Foundation, Greg Cooper. While assigned to the FBI Academy and Critical Incident Response Group, he served in several positions within the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. He was also manager of the Violent Crime Apprehension Program, known as VICAP, V-I-C-A-P. He then became the acting unit chief of the Behavioral Profiling Unit and was also the, an FBI National Academy instructor of criminal psychology, criminal investigative analysis, and analytical aspects of criminal behavior, which is today's BAU. Also with us is Dean Jackson, Deputy Executive Director of Cold Case. He is a violent crime specialist and coroner investigator who's provided training for law enforcement agencies all across the United States on homicide, missing persons, unidentified bodies, and sexual assault on cold case investigations. He also works with stress management and is an expert in death notifications. They are both accomplished authors and their book links will be below in the descriptions. We're grateful that each and every one of you are here with us. And I want to introduce to you on the left, batting first, Mr. Greg Cooper from the BAU. And then, of course, Mr. Dean Jackson. Gentlemen, welcome to tonight's show. Hi, Chris. Great to be with you. Hi, Thanks, guys. Chris. How are you? Good. Nice intro. Nice intro. I, I paid you enough for that, I guess. huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Checks in the mail, buddy, on this one. You, uh, man, oh, man. Uh, it's great to see both of you. I mean, the last time I saw you was up in, um, well, what was the name of that, uh, that cold place up there? Oh, Devil's, Devil's Lake. Lake. Yeah, Devil's Lake. <laughs> yeah. Up in Devil's Lake in North Dakota. Um, and folks, if you're just joining with us, uh, we were training, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, the cold case, uh, homicide teams up there. And then of course, you know, most recently, um, we were back up there for the first ever Native American uh, assembled team to work on uh, how many women uh, across? I think it started uh, about 1,500, I think. Yeah, it's a little over 1,500. About 1,500. So uh, it's great to see you guys tonight. Of course, you look uh, like you've grown a little hair, uh, you know, collectively. And I put them up on top, guys, uh, just for that reason. So, uh, boy, we've this got a lot. We've got a lot of cover, lot to cover tonight. And uh, 
I just kind of want to lay down the ground rules for everybody that's new to our channel. Um, you know, the Cold Case Foundation is a is a 501c3, and uh, we do everything to support law enforcement and victim families uh, across the United States uh, in working uh, alongside law enforcement agencies and sometimes embedded with law enforcement agencies uh, on active homicide and cold case investigations. Uh, and that ranges uh, all across not only the United States, but internationally, uh, where I think, you know, we've, we've even done some in Siberia. Uh, remember that caper a, a while ago? Yeah. Um, but that yeah. said, uh, we've got a, a approximately over 100 cases uh, that are being actively worked by the Cold Case Foundation with an expert team of about 137 people and growing. Uh, Greg is the executive director. Dean is the assistant executive director. And Greg is a prodigy uh, within the BAU. And Greg, give them a little background before we dive in uh, to what's going on here tonight uh, in relationship to the BAU as a whole. You bet. Um, as, as probably most of the audience is aware, the, the BAU uh, consists of behavioral profilers. Um, you've probably seen uh, a TV show referred to as Criminal Minds. Of course, you've probably heard of the movie uh, Science of the Lambs. One of the first movies that came out, we were just talking about earlier today, is called Manhunter with William Peterson. He's the one that actually made the first movie about... Uh, that unit and members of that unit. And uh, that was the first movie that was actually made about R the Red Dragon, uh, which was followed up by In Silence of the Lambs with um, Anthony Hopkins. <clears throat> and, and so what you, what you have here within the Behavioral Science Unit are, are profilers, those who look at uh, cases from a behavioral perspective, uh, trying to understand the dynamics between the victim and the offender, looking at behavioral evidence and, and then trying to interpret that behavioral evidence and projecting personality characteristics, background, experience, uh, domestics, etc., where they came from, what kind of job they might have. Um, and the, the full intent of that, of course, is to assist and support law enforcement in identifying people of interest or potential suspects uh, and a, a prototype, if you will, of the potential individual responsible for the crime. Uh, then you've got the VICAP program, which is part of the behavioral science uh, unit as well. Now, now there are two separate units actually. So it's a VICAP unit. When I was there, it was a program. So they have their own specific unit and the VICAP uh, unit consists of major case specialists who are typically former homicide Investigators and detectives are typically retired from uh, law enforcement, local law enforcement, with crime analysts uh, who then review cases as they come in, compare cases to one another, a uh, national database of unsolved homicides, missing persons, unidentified remains, and sexual assaults where there appears to be uh, serial characteristics. And so what will happen is a case will come in from an agency, submit that, to an analyst who will review it um, and compare it with cases in the database submitted by numerous law enforcement agencies around the country. Uh, make that comparison, identify any cases that appear similar in nature or to see if they have some common characteristics. And then they'll pass that on to a major case specialist who will review it. And uh, typically, if they're, if they're convinced as a result of that initial review, uh, then they'll make the determination as to whether or not they want to hold a multi-agency investigative task force or whatever other services that may be requested of uh, from that department. So I think uh, there's not probably a lot of detail we need to go in because most of the, the audience probably is very familiar with, with uh, who that group is and what they do with all of the, the Hollywood that's uh, addressed those issues and books and um, and TV shows and podcasts. Uh, you've, you've probably seen a lot of uh, previous and retired profilers that have been on television in uh, different newscasts and reviewing not only this case, but, but numerous cases uh, over the last 
20, probably 20 years, 25 years. Yep. Uh, most people are familiar with John Douglas, who's the kind of a, the pioneer, the father of, if you will, uh, modern profiling as we know it today. And um, I just had the opportunity to spend a couple of days with John last a uh, few weeks ago in, uh, in Virginia and uh, hooked up with John and Judd Ray, who was, when I was back in the unit, John was the, the uh, unit chief and became uh, my fast mentor, of course, and, and we became very close friends after uh, that experience and maintained that friendship over the years. And then Judd Ray was responsible for all the training of profilers during the time that I was there. And uh, so it was a great reunion. Well, and I guess you, I <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, and you brought in or you were there when uh, Mary Ellen came in and, and took over, right? Mary Ellen came out of uh, San Francisco. She was an agent and um, had been trained in profiling and then, uh, we selected her to come in right before I resigned from the uh, FBI and returned to local law enforcement as a police chief. And Mary Ellen was uh, really at the top of, of her game. Uh, so she came back as a full-time profiler and has done some great work. Yeah. And Ann, uh, of course, you know, Burg you know, she's, yeah. Ann Burgess is, you know, a legend in, in of herself. So, um, okay. So we've got a lot to cover and Dean, uh, we're so grateful that you're here as well because you always have some amazing insight. But uh, what I'm going to do is I want to play um, just a little bit of the video that I that Karen and I covered last night. And and I want to tell the audience today that I literally just you know talked to Greg and Dean about this you know a couple of nights ago. They've been traveling uh, all over the place you know training and teaching. They're aware of the case, but they don't have the in you know, the intimate details. I wanted this raw from Greg's perspective and from Dean's perspective so that uh, even when I talked to him, he said, I don't want to know what other individuals have said about this. I just want to kind of, you know, take this on, you know, straight. So I sent him the video. He has watched that. But what I want to do uh, is kind of walk through the neighborhood, kind of show a couple of things there. And uh, we'll start from there. And, and Greg, I'll, we're going to follow your lead uh, in relationship to um, kind of walk, kind of give everybody a high level overview of when an agency comes to the BAU. Uh, what are they looking for? Okay. You want that now or as we go, as we begin the process here? Uh, well, you tell me. You want to begin? Yeah, let, let's go ahead and begin and then we can stop periodically and then start talking about certain issues that, that would be oh, okay so i've cut all the music and everything else like that out this is just a a straight video uh going up into the neighborhood um and so, so what can you tell us chris from your perspective what can you tell us about the neighborhood as we're moving into this area so this is you know it, it struck me as just being uh an average off off campus you know, housing with a lot of apartment complexes, some single dwellings uh, around it. This is coming up into uh, the campus, of, and you're going to see the the sign here on the right. And what struck me initially was where this, uh, you'll see the University of Idaho sign right there. What struck me initially is the, it was almost as if this house had been isolated uh, and it was kind of off the beat here. Uh, so that was my first, you know, assessment of, of the area over to the right is where one of the, um, where Nathan, uh, that's his fraternity over there. And one of the victims, uh, his girlfriend, uh, they attended a party there off to the right, uh, at that, uh, fraternity house. And then as you turn the corner here, it, it, it's a dead end at this end. It's a cul-de-sac. And then when you turn to the left, you're going to see the house at about the one o'clock position. Okay. So let me stop real quick right there. As we, right before you make that turn going up the hill, is, is that a main or through street? Or is this in back? Would they have to turn back onto that main street to go get They'd out of this turn. neighborhood? 
they'd have to turn back. And his name is Ethan, not Nathan. I made a mistake there. Sorry. So he has to go, but you have to go back out the same way you come in. Right. You have to, it's a one way in one way out. Okay. okay. And that's and the then, main street as well, yeah. right? Yes. Not this street, but the main street. And, and straight right there at about the 12 o'clock position is the home. And then what's uh, what's at the top of that hill? So as we go by the, yeah, we're going to go by the crime. We're going to go by the crime scene to the right. You see the yellow tape, mm -hmm. and we're going to go up. And these are apartment complexes where a lot of students are staying. Uh, it goes around, and then if you follow it all the way around, it's going to take you back on a road that I'll show you here in a second. But this dead ends down here as well. So you are literally trapped within this geographic region here, if you come in by car. Okay. Chris, do you know if, is it just students or are there um, other individuals that live there in addition to? I, I don't have that answer. Yep. But there are residential areas or homes rather in there that um, are just local residents, not necessarily affiliated with the school or students. Yes, I believe so, yes. Uh, first thing that would strike me about this is is that anybody that's going into that area, it, it's intentional. They're not just roaming. Um, there's one way in, basically, and evidently, and and one way out, uh, with the exception of of going through side streets uh, in that neighborhood. But in order to get out of that neighborhood, you have to go down that main street, correct? Yes. Okay. So it's intentional. Um, whoever is there, who whoever either resides there or is visiting there uh, for one reason or another, is there on purpose. Um, they're not just walking around randomly. Uh, they aren't, um, or they may be visiting. They could be visiting friends, uh, visiting family, uh, coming in and out of that area with the intent of something specific, whether they live there or they're visiting somebody or they're there to, for some kind of work, um, of support work in the, in the neighborhood, for example. Um, but it's not a random kind of roaming that you're going to be seeing. This is not uh, an area that people would just drive through for sightseeing, that type of thing. But they have an on purpose, intentional purpose for being there, and and so does the offender, in this case. Okay, so this is the house, the home, uh, straight ahead, and you can see that side street right there, uh, where we're going to take a left. Okay, if if we were to continue where I backed up the truck a moment ago, if we were to continue around that building it will take you to the area that we're going to go up here uh, to the top. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a giant loop then. It's a giant loop. Right. And at the, uh, the day of the incident, there were vehicles to the right side of the street here parked all the way up that uh, lane. there, And it was 28 degrees, uh, icy snow uh, combo. And the authorities um, have reported that um, that it appears to be a, a targeted event. Um, so thoughts on uh, any of those things coming into play here in your minds? Well, we, we don't know exactly uh, why they referred to it as a targeted event. It, it would be open to speculation. And that may be accurate speculation, but typically when we talk about a, a targeted event, it suggests that um, there was that these victims were intentionally identified as victims and as potential victims prior to the event. <clears throat> How do they make that determination? Um, there's a number of things that, that they would look at. Um, the, the location of the home, how entrance may or may not have been made, uh, the 
types of behavior that may be uh, there um, manifest between the victim and the offender, the way in which the crime uh, may have been committed from a behavioral perspective. Um, we look at, uh, and one of the first things that we look at in any case is victimology. Um, that for whatever reason, the uh, authorities have determined or at least initially believe that it's an isolated incident, meaning that the offender had no other interest in potentially looking at other victims. Uh, and when I say that, I say that initially. And we don't know what the offender may be experiencing subsequently, uh, only that, they, that uh, the individual is there intentionally, on purpose, has identified that particular location for a specific reason. Uh, is it for convenience? Well, there's a lot of homes in that area. Uh, is it most likely? It's because they not only have access and familiarity to the uh, crime scene in this case, or the home, um, but one has to ask the question, so why, why select that home? Why select that residence? Why select those victims? <clears throat> so those are some of the things that, questions that, that must be asked during that analysis phase. Um, and uh, I think the, the reference to being targeted uh, has to do with answers, subsequent investigation that's being done in that victimology uh, and entrance and access to the, the location um, and a sense that intentionally that was the specific location that that offender desired to go into and commit this particular type of crime. So what becomes critical here if if this idea of that it's a targeted crime, how, how you know, why, why even say that at this point, right? Yeah, I, I think, um, and, and let me say this too from the, the onset here, that I think the authorities are doing an absolutely fantastic job. Yeah. They've uh, pulled out every resource that's available to them. Uh, the local police department has done a great job managing it. They've asked uh, experts coming from um, other agencies, which oftentimes you don't see uh, for a number of different reasons. And I think the fact that they're willing to look beyond their own resources and invite outside resources, if you will, uh, is, is really a good sign. Uh, and it's, it's a stretch to include as many experts as possible to take a look at this. And uh, I really applaud that agency for doing that and those agencies that are participating. So at this point, there are at least uh, two other agencies involved, if I understand correctly, the FBI, Behavioral Science or Behavioral Analysis Unit. Um, and is it the state? Yeah, uh, ISP. Idaho State, yeah. So Idaho State Police. <clears throat> So I applaud all of them. Uh, so c coming together uh, and applying their resources uh, is the most effective approach that they could take. And I think that, uh, uh, that the local agency there who made that decision, the chief administrative uh, person who is the chief of police uh, should be applauded for that. And he's doing a, a very good job. Uh, in seeking outside assistance and support because he, he doesn't want to make any mistakes. He's trying to avoid mistakes. I mean, who, who among us in law enforcement can prepare and train for this type of a crime? In this particular agency, you haven't had a homicide in what I think I heard that there may have been a homicide 17 years ago. Um, and so they don't have homicides in this area. And this, this is reminiscent of, of uh, medium and small agencies or departments and medium and small cities across America. They just don't have this level of violence. And 
to bring in expertise uh, and those folks that have that experience is uh, a real benefit and advantage. So, so what do you so think? To, to answer your question, I think uh, they seem to be confident that it's an isolated event. And to, to make that assessment and or to make it public, uh, I think is to help send the message out to the public that the particular offender in this case has identified these particular individuals as victims and that there doesn't seem to be um, an, an expansion or interest of victims outside of this particular crime scene. Hey, uh, what do you think about the the geographic isolation of this particular home with an access point uh, that's pitch black, by the way, at night? And one of the lights down at the bottom of the hill there on attached to the building was not functioning. Uh, it appears that there's lights on the back patio here. Uh, there's string lights. Uh, they're on. Uh, they've held this scene for a couple of weeks. Uh, this was taken on um, Thanksgiving Day. Uh, but I found it interesting that this one hill here goes directly down into the property. But, of course, you can also come from the other side. Uh, you, The ice, though, and the snow made that particular um, road very, very uh, slippery. Mm. And so I was thinking, okay... The, talk about risk level to the offender by driving a car sure. up into this area. <clears throat> well, I think it gives us some insights uh, to the offender uh, from the perspective of selection, selection of the victims, selection of the location, uh, of familiarity. Uh, most likely, it's not a random location or necessarily random victims. Um, the offender is most likely very familiar with this area, how to get there, who lives there. Uh, also, what the, the conditions and circumstances are uh, within uh, that residence with respect to who lives there, uh, what condition they may be in at the particular time that uh, he decides to go in <clears throat> and make entrance. Uh, I think based upon the time, uh, the location, and some of the, from a victimology perspective, some of the activities that may have been reported that uh, the victims were involved in before they came home that night, placed uh, potentially the, the victims in a more vulnerable situation uh, and increased the confidence level of the offender uh, based upon the knowledge that uh, the individual has of those victims and what they've been doing in the condition that they were in, which included, as, as we understand it, they were in bed, asleep, or partially asleep. <clears throat> um, and depending on what uh, activities they were involved in, if, if, for example, they had ingested some alcoholic beverages before they went in there, it also uh, renders them uh, a, li a, a bit more uh, less reactive and responsive, particularly from uh, a defense perspective. And it gives the advantage to the offender, and the offender knows this. Dean, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I had a question for you, and that was, you know, you were talking about in the that back parking lot area. Is that how difficult would it be to get down off that into the back of the house? Because I can't Very really easy. see. Very easy. So it wouldn't be difficult. They wouldn't have. It's not real slick or steep then, or. Well, I mean, you'd have to be familiar with the terrain and how to navigate it, right? That's the back patio that I was po pointing to there. Um, okay. 
but it, it's not difficult to get down that hill. Is there any obstacles? Is there a fence when you get down to the bottom that has to be gone over? Mm -hmm. or you're directly into the backyard. You're, you're directly into their backyard. The fence is off to the right. Uh, you'll see, I'm going to turn the camera here, but you can see the chain link fence off to the right. And then you'll see what I thought this was, you know, a pretty, this was, this would have been very difficult um, terrain in terms of, you know, um, you know, to navigate, getting out of there, right? If that was the case. Well, it right. seems like the, uh, that would be pretty yeah, it seems like the location, uh, particularly that parking lot, if I'm understanding correctly, normally is pretty full of cars, right? All that yes. whole parking lot area where you're standing. So uh, if you think so about that. it, yeah. So if you think about it, you know, somebody just kind of slinking around in there, if, you know, as Greg's talking about this being somewhere they're familiar, familiarity would tend to lend itself to, you know, they've been there before. Um, so, you know, they're going to be able to slip in and out of that area if they're on foot back behind those cars down in that area and really not be seen by anybody. Um, if you bring a vehicle up in there, you start creating a lot of different issues that people are going to see the vehicle. Number one, if it's late at night and dark, somebody may see somebody that may not be able to see your face or know exactly who you are. Um, the other issue is, is I think, um, with the vehicle, you know, just moving it up in there from what you've been describing and others I've seen are describing, just being able to get lucky enough to find a place to park if you got the car up in there may be a challenge as well. So I think that tends to lead itself to somebody at least coming up from from down from that maze that Taylor Road, I think it's called down there, the main road down there. Yes. Uh, so coming up at least from there by foot, if they're not already in the area, would, would tend to make uh, a lot more sense. And I think, you know, as Greg alluded to as well, the, the when you start talking about targeted or whatever, the, the timeline seems to be very significant. Um, you know, this isn't somebody who got into that house at a time when they hoped everybody was gone and they were they surprised people. I mean, everything about it sounds like you would anticipate in the middle of the night that people who live there would be there. So um, I think that tends to lend itself as well to that targeted concept. Yeah. So, go ahead. All, yeah, another thought is um, because it's a bit hazardous in terms of access and exit, hazardous from, you said that there's ice there, you've got a lot of wet leaves, um, it, it also the, the ability to, to maneuver between the other vehicles, um, and between the buildings is going to create much more effort on the side of an offender in the event, in the event that the individual drives a vehicle into that area, which is also elevates the, uh, the potential risk level of getting stuck uh, slipping and sliding, uh, making a lot of noise, attracting and drawing a lot of attention uh, from neighbors and anybody else that may be outside. Um, so if, if the individual drives a vehicle there, it's probably most likely going to be parked in a, a, a convenient location for the offender to get to, to get out as quickly as possible, uh, or to a location where he or she had to walk to uh, the crime scene and walk back to their vehicle. So if a vehicle is involved, it most likely would not have been parked there close by that particular residence. Uh, but in a, in a position where they could easily get to it, get in and get out quickly. So you're going to see one other uh contact or potential uh, um, way to get into this particular property here. Um, and it's down from Taylor. It's a path that goes direct right into the house. But uh, uh, before we get to that piece of the puzzle here, um, thoughts on, so we got a lot going on here, I thought, uh, behind the house. 
Uh, and, you know, we see that screen there. It looks like it's got a rock on it holding it down. Uh, but then there's a cinder block uh, just below that one window there. Now, mind you, this house has five women staying in it. So let's talk about, and the, and the murder weapon the police have, have described as a large, um, you know, military style knife kind of concept. Okay. A fixed blade. Uh, you know, and that knife, uh, according to what the authorities have said, uh, is very significant in this, and they're not giving much de many details about it. So let's talk about two things, Greg. I want your, your, to weigh in on your thoughts on why this block could be important or not important, and also why the significance of this knife, what it means to a, an offender who has the, you know, the chutzpah mm -hmm. to come into a home uh, where multiple people are victimized here. Are you tracking where I'm, what I'm I asking? Think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, first of all, the block and, and the block you're talking about is okay. Right underneath the, the window. Yep. All right. So this would be what the second floor from the backside. Yes. Right. So it doesn't appear that that block would be necessary to lift themselves up to a point where they could get into the window because it's, it looks like the, the bottom portion of that window is just probably what two, three, two, three feet, maybe mm -hmm. before the bottom. So um, depending on when, when that block was placed there, and we don't know when it was placed there. Uh, this is uh, a few weeks, or, or how long after the fact was, was it identified there, Chris? Uh, we we don't know. We don't know. It's just okay. there. It's still there. Okay. So um, we would may have to make a presumption that the that the law enforcement. Uh, didn't feel like it was significant enough to re to take it as potential evidence. Well, they still have the scene. They still have the scene. Oh, okay. So they're still maintaining control of the scene and yes. everything in it. Okay. <clears throat> right. right. All right. So what's the, what's the point of that particular um, block? It, it's not needed to elevate oneself to get in through the window. It doesn't appear um, unless you're very small. Uh, that is not what we would expect in this particular case, if it has anything to do with, with uh, entrance into uh, the residence. <clears throat> but it's, it's possible that we know, for example, that many offenders will survey their, their victims over a period of time. Um, and sometimes that may be done through uh, voyeuristic types of activities, uh, peeping through windows at night, for example, uh, that is in a location where such, uh, such activity would be common at that particular location. If knowing that the, the residence is filled with uh, females um, and if there was an interest in any one or each of them that would be a good location possibly not knowing what's on the other side of that window because we don't know <clears throat> potentially a good location for for viewing at night and peeping at night and that would be in, if that's accurate then that would be in expectation anticipation and fantasizing about uh, the potential crime or depending on what those the motivation is uh, and there's, there's a, more questions than answers at this point, but you have to take a look at each of these aspects and start asking the questions, uh, which will lead the investigation to the point that you can answer them. But it is a good location for convenience to peer into uh, a window under the cloak of darkness. Dean? Yeah, I think what's interesting to me about it is the 
it's not just a block, but there's, it looks like that's a, a stone or something on top of it, almost like a little stool. Um, so you don't, and you don't find anything else there like that around. Now, if there's a logical answer for it, um, you know, if the, if the residents come back and say, yeah, we used it for X, Y, and Z, that would, you know, that's all obviously something that has to be uh, looked at, but I think it's the location of it, where it is, um, to Greg's point, I think you could see, you know, if that stone wasn't on there, I think that uh, block, half a block would be a lot more uncomfortable. That smoother stone on top makes it almost look kind of like a stool. You know, you could, you could literally see somebody sitting on that and they would have a perfect, you know, look through the bottom portion of that window uh, into what's there. So, I mean, it's definitely something that would uh, needs to be looked at. Um, we talked about the screen uh, a little bit earlier, and I think, you know, I could never really tell with the, I, I tried blowing it up with the video you sent. Um, there are leaves on that screen, but that one in the middle, it, it looks to me like it could be one of those grayish rocks. So if that's the case, then, you know, it could be something that even one of the residents, you know, they, they didn't want it to blow away, but it had come off or they weren't sure how to put it back on. So they weighted it down with a rock could be a simple explanation. I, I, I think the biggest issue in all of this is just being willing to ask questions, right? I mean, things that the more questions you can ask uh, and if you find good legitimate answers to them, great, move on if you can't. Uh, but you know, looking at it from this perspective, and I'm assuming from what you've been describing, Chris, that if this was night and if it was, you know, somebody sitting back there at night, it would be very difficult for somebody to see them back there. Is that correct? Yeah, it's pitch black. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a perfect, perfect place uh, for somebody who's voyeuristic to go hang out. That's for which, sure. Which leads me into a thought. Um uh, Explain why, uh, Greg, explain why pre-incident behavior is so crucial to understand, uh, you know, in relationship to these types of crimes. Yeah, and, and it depends on the nature of the crime. And in a situation like this, pre-incident behavior, you would expect, based upon this offender's most likely level of confidence, uh, both with respect to the selection of a particular weapon and, and the manner in which that weapon was used um, and the results of using that weapon. Um, that there's a level of confidence there which suggests in terms of pre-incident behavior that potential for planning, uh, fantasizing when, when we fantasize any of us fantasize about <clears throat> any legitimate thing we're basically enacting an event before it occurs mentally right and we know that using one's imagination in the creation of certain circumstances in our thought process we know that um, we can actually perform better in reality when we do so, based depending on how much time and effort uh, and interest that we show in that fantasy and thought process or imagination. Um, the more time we spend at it, the more articulation we give to the fantasy. Um, we know, for example, that athletes spend uh, a significant amount of time mentally, psychologically, seeing themselves in a situation um, in performing in, in athletic events, etc., And that they've been able to determine, of course, that the more time they spend in that, that they will actually improve their performance without ever even having to go out and practice. Uh, I'm not saying you do that exclusively. I'm saying supplemented by practicing, in fact. So that mental practice is exactly what an offender does in anticipation of committing a crime. And the more mental practice they give it, the more effective they can become in trying to anticipate what's going to happen, how, 
how to get how to get into a residence, um, the surveillance that we talked about, the voyeuristic activities, uh, the selection of a particular uh, weapon, in this case, a knife. Why that particular weapon? Why not take in a gun? It would have been cleaner, quicker, uh, much less, uh, much more impersonal than the use of a knife. The knife is, is much more personal. They have more control. Uh, it's a projection of the offender, not just into the crime itself, but, but that intimate projection into the victim. Um, it's an extension of their genitalia, if, if I... I think in, in many cases it can be argued, depending on the nature of the crime. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what we're lacking in this case, to really give it a full spectrum of, of assessment, is we don't know exactly the nature of the wounds. We don't know the exact location of the wounds. We don't know how many of the wounds... Uh, were administered here in this case to to each one of the victims. Um, we make assumptions based upon comments and statements that have been made, but it's always there's always a level of risk uh, that we take when we assume anything, right? So uh, we've got to be very careful about how we characterize certain things because we don't have all the information. It's not out there. But suffice it to say, with respect to that weapon, the individual selects the weapon because they're comfortable with it. It's a personal thing. They kept it. Most likely they haven't. Uh, most likely they, they keep it for personal reasons because it's it serves, uh, it can be ser servicing them in, with respect to anything from fantasy, reliving the event, all the way to uh, a practical use for the weapon that may be utilized for the individual based right. upon what their job may be, what their uh, activities and, and uh, you know, for example, hunting, et cetera, things like that. You may use it for practical purposes. You know, sometimes people get the misunderstanding of when, whenever, you know, we say the, the idea that the knife is personal, it's, it's not necessarily personal to the victim. Uh, no. it's, it's personal to the perpetrator mm -hmm. that that knife selection um, has all kinds of meaning to that individual. And, and it's, it works its way up in relationship to uh, help, help folks understand the fantasy process. Uh, and, you know, like, you know, what, what's going on in this guy's right. mind. And, and I say guy, because, you know, people beat me up the other night for, you know, saying it was a, you know, it could be a woman, but, you know, okay, well, in my, you know, 300 plus murders that I've ever worked, yeah. uh, I rarely had a female commit a homicide unless it was a domestic self-defense, you know, quite frankly. Uh, but something like this, you know, where you, you have the, the weapon selected, you have this isolated home here in terms of you know, it's, it's described as being a social uh, house where folks can come and, you know, come and go. They're the, the victims, you know, Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan are great kids and they're social butterflies. Mm -hmm. um, and help us understand the mindset of the individual uh, who, how much time do they take before they do what they do here, this tragedy? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I, I think that <clears throat> it's difficult to, uh, to give a reasonable answer to that simply because uh, we don't know the behavioral characteristics at the crime scene and how much time the offender stays there in, in the crime scene with each individual, uh, how there may be differences between uh, each of the victims in terms of uh, the wounds that they receive, what the uh, ev the event behavior is, that is the, the incident behavior as it relates to the assault itself. Uh, it, are there differences between the location, manner, nature of the wounds, etc. between the victims? Are there, we don't know if, if there was any post-offense behavior uh, 
of the victims or with the victims afterward. Because what, so, so typically what we find is the more behavior that is spent there in the crime scene with, and the, with the uh, victim, the types of behavior that are manifest and expressed by the offender toward a particular victim, because these are all individual victims. It, it's not as if uh, somebody didn't walk through here and throw a, a hand grenade into a house. These are all very intimate, close, personal uh, crimes committed by two, two individuals, individuals that in one way or another mean something to this offender and represent something to the offender. <clears throat> um, I don't know if that answers your question there, Chris, but it, 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 and we don't know what those behaviors are. And without that, it's difficult to interpret. Right. What, what we know, right, is we have five young women yep. in this home and one young man, right? Four of you know, uh, at the time, right? Uh, you've got two downstairs, two upstairs, and two in the middle. So the young man was there that evening, you know, Ethan with his girlfriend. Okay. But he doesn't, does he generally stay there or is it, was that just I don't, a... I, I don't know that personally. I don't know that. But he's there that night. And you know, there's thoughts, you know, of folks saying, you know, the, the offender waited for everybody to come home uh, and then, you know, attacked. Um, and my thinking was that, you know, Ethan was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. um, that the girls were the targets. Yeah. Um, what say you? I think that uh, any offender going into that, that environment <clears throat> knew or expected um, that, it, that most likely it was going to be the girls present only. Um, most likely the offender is surprised by the presence of Ethan <clears throat> and necessarily didn't expect him to be there. Why? Um, we go back to, to victimology, but also from the risk level of the offender. What, what is an offender going to do to ensure the success of their crime? Um, what types of precautions may be taken in order to ensure that success and to protect their identity, um, to ensure the success of the crime and to effect their escape? Most likely, an individual is not going to select a time, a location, and a victim that has the ability to fight and protect themselves, an equal ability, meaning that the offenders, from a, a mental perspective, psychological perspective, is going to attempt to plan this thing out, anticipate how can I be most effective and efficient in this and protect myself from getting caught, getting injured, um, not to, uh, from getting, uh, ensuring the submission of the, of the victim. So they're not going to purposely necessarily, most of, the, most of the time you're not going to see them purposely identify as a challenge, a potential victim that's going to present a risk to them. And so I think you're probably accurate. I think that most likely uh, Ethan was not anticipated to have been there that night. And he was familiar with the area, familiar with the location, familiar with who was in that home and what type of resistance may have been presented to him. And then so when you take a look at the time in which the crime was committed and the condition of the victims, it elevates the success level, potential success for the 
for the offender. And Ethan would not be necessarily part of that equation. It would be just the opposite. So the, um, the next part here is I just happen to be on the public sidewalk there. You can see just to the left of that tape. And I was walking around. I looked down. And, you know, you can see the snow just barely covering what appeared to be a black object. And I thought, hmm, interesting. And so I walked around the uh, trash can there, and lo and behold, uh, it appeared to be a glove. And, you know, the, the great thing about the Internet now is, you know, people have got me planning the glove there, you know, with my wife, you know, standing right next to me as if, you know, as if I got time for that, right? in life but you know well welcome to the you know to the blood sport you know called the internet that 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 said anyway i look down i see this glove uh i immediately notified the authorities who came over and and collected it and you know and we don't know its involvement in any way shape or form i mean it could be post-incident it could be pre-incident i mean we don't know but I thought it was significant just to kind of point it out and, and grab it, you know, i.e. The, the PD. And they did. They collected it, you know, to their credit again. And and I think people forget they still control this crime scene. Yeah. So it does go properly into evidence. But I thought it was interesting that it was sitting there. Um, and, you know, I picked it up in terms of visually, mm-hmm. uh, not physically. If you say anything, <laughs> you you're wrong. So it is what it is. But anyway, that said, uh, there it is right there. You get a better look at it. So one of the other things that I think is really interesting here is in the front of this house, there is a path that goes straight down and you'll see other uh, cinder blocks. There are three, you know, double type cinder blocks to the left there. Uh, It's not the same one in the back of the house. That's the one I was talking about. I didn't find any of these others like this other than one other on an apartment behind me. Uh, So I thought that one cinder block, you know, a single, just kind of, it just did not look right. It was just sitting there underneath that window. And I thought, wow, you know, is this a voyeurism situation? You know, I've heard, you know, it's a barbecue situation. You know, people use them for benches, put their burgers on them and stuff. Well, yeah, okay, that's, I guess that could be a possibility too, but voyeurism can also be a possibility. So, you know, don't discount the barbecue, you know, for the for the voyeurism, I guess, in my mind, because how many of those offenders have we seen, you know, post-incident who have done some horrific crimes and they tell us, yeah, you know, I was staring in her windows for months. I mean, who was the who was uh, who was the guy? Did over 500 rapes, uh, and he used to walk away from the the pair of boots on yeah. the porch. What was his name again? I forget that guy. Uh, he's in custody, thank goodness. 400, <coughs> 400 years, but what used to deter him was a pair of men's boots, uh, a very large pair of boots. So I recommended to my daughter years ago, you know, buy boots and put them on your porch. No matter what, yeah. uh, make sure they're used. <laughs> yeah, make sure they're used. But did that not that deterred well, him? Didn't it? Well, in in fact, um, he said that that would have deterred him. Yeah, and that that information came to us as a result of interviews that we had done with him. He was a serial rapist, eighty five rapes over about five years, <clears throat> and after it was all said and done, I uh, asked him the question. Well, what what would you tell potential victims of, uh, from somebody like you? How would they avoid becoming a victim of of, uh, of a sexual assault by somebody like you? Uh, because he said that eighty five percent of the time, I asked him, how did how did you get inside of these residences? Like, did you broke in, you know, forced entry. Uh, he said 100% of the time of those 85 rapes, he went in through unlocked doors or unlocked windows. Yeah. 
And I said, so are you telling me you never came across an unlocked door or rather a locked door or a locked window? He says, oh, no, I, I came across them. I just went to the next one. Yeah. So, sure. so he, he never made the effort, didn't have to take make the effort for forced entry. And so, so then I, I asked the next question that we followed up with him and asked him, all right, so what can they do to avoid somebody like you? He says, number one, lock your doors and windows. Number two, because all, all of his victims he selected were uh, single females or single females with children. Uh, and he said to give the appearance, the perception that there is a man in the home. Uh, and he gave the recommendation, tell these women to get a pair of boots, construction boots, army boots, and scuff them up uh, as if they're being used um, and active. Uh, you have a, an individual that, that gives a perception. You've got a, a male in the home that uh, is engaged in more you know, physical manual labor types of activities that who can gives a per perception, of course, that they can take care of themselves. If they're going to resist, there's going to be a fight, and the chances that you're going to be successful are slim and none. So he would avoid those. So that was information that came directly from him as to what potential would-be victims should do to prevent becoming a victim of certain types of crime. Just lock your doors and windows, very simple, and make it appear that uh, there's a male in that in that home. Yeah, and that's and that's we're not coming from you know for our our, our audience we're not coming from a sexist position, you know by saying that we're just repeating what the offender said. Yeah, uh, this is this what he told. Yeah, yeah, these are his words, and because I know, you know that the the victims here uh, fought uh, based on what the authorities have reported this this suspect off. So. Uh, there's no question in my mind, my sweetheart would fight, you know, a, a million percent. And, you know, God bless these, you know, young women that did fight this guy uh, if they had the opportunity. But w what this perpetrator was saying is lower your risk level by doing these couple of things. And especially now with the environment as, you know, hyperactive as it is in this, and this is the officer right there. He's be leaning over, taking a photograph of the glove. Um, and then later they come back and they collect it. Um, but right here, I want to show you the other interesting piece that I saw. So let me back it up here for a second. Uh, let me go back over here. So, you know, can, I, can I make a real quick comment too of about, that, go ahead. Go about ahead. that glove? Uh, as I recall, the photograph that you showed us, the, the glove had leaves on top of it and uh, remnants of snow. Yeah. Um, and and that was fairly recent that you found it. So we don't know uh, at the time that the, the crime had been committed. We don't know if it's even related to this crime, of course, or to an offender potentially. Uh, but if it was there, we don't even know if it was there at the time the crime had been committed. But what I'm going to suggest here is even if it were there, that uh, there's a, based upon the fact that the leaves were on top of it and the snow, it could have been much more at the time that the crime was committed. So it would have been out of uh, view and uh, sight of any investigators who may have. Yeah, you can see it right there. The snow's on top of it, clearly. Yeah. You know, and um, so... You know, I'm fresh out of planning evidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a joke for everybody, you know, for all the clowns out there. You, you know, know, Chris, before you jump to this next section, too, just what you were talking about as far as, you know, uh, being prepared and, and uh, what ladies can do. I think I think the problem with most people is we, we project – our values, our morals onto other people. And so we don't think of it from the perspective of a predator. Um, but if you look at, for example, if you go to bear country, um, one of the first things they'll tell you, the rangers will tell you is don't store your food where you're sleeping and where you're living. You have to create a cache, try to put it high to do that. It's because that's the behavior of 
that predator. That predator will come right into where you're sleeping and do that. And I think we don't think it's hard for human beings to think of another person as a as a predatory uh, animal. And I think the truth is, is that, you know, thousands and thousands of people are not, uh, you know, we go through our day, uh, we encounter all kinds of different people, but when you get around, it only takes one, right? It doesn't, this doesn't, you know, for something like this to happen in this community, it didn't take hundreds of predators in this community. It took one to come into their rooms at night and to do that. So I think if people can think of it from that context, what we're really talking about here is, is understanding that you may be in a situation where there are pred where there is a predator. It doesn't even have to be multiples. Here's the precautions that you need to do uh, to make sure you don't get, um, you don't raise your risk level. And I think that's what we're always looking at. How do we lower the risk level? Yeah, that's what I love about this channel because we can, we can help. We can help, you know, these young women. I mean, you know, I have four children, a daughter. You know, I think about her all the time. And, and I think about, you know, if my daughter was on this campus, what would I want her to know right now? Uh, I would want her to understand the mindset of the individual that we're dealing with. I would also want her to take precautions in relationship to lowering her risk level to the mindset that we're understanding here. And that's why I'm so grateful that each of you are here tonight. And Greg, I mean, you, you come to this table, you know, as the real deal. I mean, the, the people that showed up there, you know, they would have come to your class and, you know, here we are today uh, with this tragedy and these four, you know, victims, uh, I can't keep getting out of my mind the idea of, okay, you've got a, we've got a house of five, you know, young women who are social butterflies, amazing human beings, um, absolutely, you know, loved by everybody that they run into, uh, normal, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, some, you know, some dysfunctioning you know, breakups and all that other stuff, like every other human being. Uh, yet within this environment now, they find themselves going out partying a little bit, coming home and never going home again. It's over. And it's not their fault. It is literally this predator out there. And I, and I could not have thought of anybody but to have you on to talk about that predatorial mindset. And, and by the way, Greg has written a book called Predators. If you have, go into Amazon and, and look it up, Predators by Greg Cooper. Um, so you're the perfect person that can talk to this. I mean, look at this, look at this path here and you're going to see the, a different angle, but I'm interested in your opinion on what you think about this particular situation here so that that makes it convenient that pathway that makes it convenient to get access to any building on both sides uh, of the pathway for potential purposes of voyeurs for example and so any kind of security devices, particularly lights, and uh, would be highly recommended uh, to maintain, particularly uh, you know those lights that uh, are, are triggered by movement. So eventually, if somebody were to walk into that area at a particular time of of night, for example, immediately lights would, would illuminate the area. Um, so easy access is, is an issue there. In terms of the predatory behaviors, predators either identify their victims because they're on the hunt looking for them. They know the type of victim that they're looking for or prefer. And that's, uh, having said that, 
we also know that depending on the circumstances that a, that a predatory individual may out of convenience, <clears throat> circumstance, opportunity, select a victim <clears throat> uh, for those very reasons, not because they prefer that victim, but because at that particular time, uh, they can take advantage of the situation and the victim at the wrong time, the wrong place. <clears throat> but typically, crimes like this, uh, so often we find that somewhere along the line in their social activities, the victims and the predator have crossed paths. Whether it be through voyeuristic activities or whether it be through social activities, uh, in, th in this case, the more information that's acquired about the victims individually and collectively to the degree that they participate with each other in those activities, the, the higher the, the chances are that you're going to identify <clears throat> a potentially a time and a place where um, something happened to attract the attention of the offender who for whatever reason made the decision to select them as potential targets and this individual is very confident would you agree with that Absolutely. Very confident. The individual doesn't walk into a uh, home in the middle of the night, assuming the lights were out, with he most likely or, or she is anticipating that there are at least four, if not five or six potential um, victims inside that home without a level of confidence that they can handle this situation. That before they've gone in, they've identified the who, the what, the how, and subsequently how they're going to get out of there as quickly as possible uh, without being identified. And and why is that? Meaning, what they're they're going to have blood on them? Yeah, in a case like this, you'd expect that there's there's going to be blood transference for one thing uh, that he's got the victim's blood all over himself and he has to get to a, a location where he can clean up oftentimes we've seen uh, offenders clean up at crime scenes before they leave um, or there's a there's a safe haven if you will a location whether it be a residence or, or a vehicle that they can get into and conceal themselves from uh, being seen by others who may be able to identify them and see that they're soiled as a result. Um, and this offender would be no different. Uh, so there may have been efforts to clean up before he leaves the residence. Um, but in a situation like this, knowing assuming he knows that there may be other victims, potential victims in that house that for whatever reason he decides not to attack or she <clears throat> has to leave and leave in a hurry. Um, and in doing so, he knows that he can get to a place through that those pre-planning stages, get to a place where he can clean up, he's protected, and coming in at that particular time uh, and place in the middle of the night is not going to cause a great deal of alarm or attention if there were anybody if there was anybody else in the in the, a residence, for example. So that begs the question about okay, well, does the individual live with somebody? Are they roommates? Is he a loner? Is he by himself? <clears throat> Those are all questions that will be considered. Uh, by the uh, behavioral analysts and the detectives as they go through this process. So uh, thoughts on um, personality type, right? Confident? Mm -hmm. um, chameleon, Confident. Chameleon personality? 
Okay. Confident. Uh, most uh, he's has the ability to plan. Uh, has a level of organization within that confident uh, circle that he is familiar with. For example, the selection of the the weapon, the use of the weapon. He has the uh, he's adapted to the use of that weapon and the utility of it. Although in a case like this, with so many victims, there's a high chance that he may have cut himself. Uh, and we hope that that is the case because that opens up potential leads for the investigators to pursue in trying to identify potentially who, who the offender is. So we'll keep, uh, keep our hopes for that area. But he's organized at that level, at least, at least in terms of this particular crime, but we don't know more detail about the crime scene which would give us more insight in terms of the level of sophistication that may have been utilized in this, in this case. Um, but the fact that he was able to carry it off successfully with that weapon for victims was a level of sustained aggression throughout the course of these events from one victim to another. Uh, suggests that this individual has has the ability to make those plans, commits themselves, goal oriented, and once he makes the, a determination, what he's going to do has the ability to follow through and complete it. Um, definitely, uh, most likely, uh, this 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 type of crime is consistent with an individual with uh, personality disorders, uh, as in uh, psychopathology, has been able to rationalize why and who uh, the in terms of the victims uh, lacks empathy remorse uh, is able to justify anything that they do by blaming typically projecting blame onto uh, the victim not knowing what the you know we, we say that most likely that uh, they have crossed paths at some point well we don't know what the nature of that intersection was like and interaction was like um, in terms of a reception, um, whether there may have been a perceived or real insult taken by an individual uh, or just a um, an obsessive fixated interest in one or uh, more than one of those victims. So those are all questions that during the course of their investigation they're considering. So uh, socially, um, how do you see this uh, hmm. in terms of this rejection aspect of it? Uh, how does that play out um, in how the how does the knife correlate hmm. to that social rejection? Do, do you know what I mean by that? Uh, you know, often in cases like this, it's a, um, a sense of punishment and the administration of punishment toward the victim, uh, whether it be real or perceived. And typically it's perceived. Uh, in other words, it's in the mind of the offender, uh, but there may not have been, it could have been some innocuous interaction but in the mind of the offender uh, who took offense to it for whatever reason has justified why the why he, he or she has just selected these victims uh, and to commit the crime in this particular way um, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to talk uh, too much about personality characteristics um, from a a profiler's perspective, because that at this point in the investigation, uh, that uh, that information is best in the hands of law enforcement. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so this is the fraternity house where uh, Ethan and his girlfriend were. And what's interesting about this 
And, you know, there's a whole bunch of theories floating around about points of entry uh, into the target house at 1122. Uh, You know, some folks are theorizing that he had got into the house before everybody, you know, when he was waiting for them. Uh, And then, of course, you know, it's the attack at that point. But, you know, we don't know what the facts are going to be. But I find this this particular uh, point of entry opportunity presents itself, you know, hypothetically. uh, If there's a car involved, this seems like a pretty logical place to park the vehicle because now there's an egress uh, in terms of an escape route, right? If if somebody were to park on the street, they come, you know, right back down to the car, boom, they're in, they're gone. Okay, versus parking up into those two dead ends uh, up up the street. Are you guys, are, are you with me on that one or do you have any other different opinion? Yeah, okay. easy, easier access, easy yeah. exit. Okay, so that's that's dealing with a car. So the the other aspect that you brought up earlier, Greg, and uh, is this idea of is the su- is this is the suspect on foot, mm-hmm. and you know that would mean a whole bunch of other things that he or she, but I'm going to go with he <laughs> for me, uh, <laughs> yeah. and I mean because statistically, right? I sure. mean it's more about statistics than it is. <clears throat> because we don't know what the facts are in the crime scene and the, what we do know is, you know, what the coroner reported uh, upper torso uh, type uh, wound patterns. Well, and being able to control, you know, four victims um, under this set of circumstances, while, while it's, it's uh, the victims were uh, at a disadvantage because uh, of their condition, uh, sleeping, um, possibly having partying a bit that night, uh, whether maybe some alcohol on board. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so it, the, to, that's to the offender's advantage, but even in, under those set of circumstances with this amount of people involved, uh, the level of confidence, uh, most likely this is, is a male, no doubt. Okay. So this is, I thought, I thought this one, I mean, right there, just from the street, mm you can see the front door of that home and you know i there are no there are no cameras or anything on any of these eaves to these other houses and there's no there are no lights yeah. going through here so i'm assuming in the you know at various times of the evening this is you know it's a very dark area here because now when you get up onto their street to the left is also that light is out. And so I talked to the neighbor who's in the corner apartment up there. He's a PhD student, a very nice person. And he told us, uh, Karen and I, that, you know, this light just got fixed a couple of days after, you know, post incident. But he said before that it was pitch black and you had to always wear he walks his dog. He had to wear a, one of those headlamps, a camping headlamp, basically, to walk his dog. Okay? And it's not, uh, you know, I thought that was very interesting. So that would mean even in this area here, you probably have some light from this one house here to the right. You know, that porch light, if that porch light was on, you'd have some illumination coming out this way. But once you pass that house, um, you know, there's another home behind it. But so, Chris, it, isn't it true that you guys found this after you got up in there and you were walking around the front of the house and then you saw this coming down through there? You didn't see it when you initially drove by. No, exactly. I, we well, didn't I even think, know it. Just, it was a surprise. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I think, I think even that lends itself to the fact that, you know, somebody – outside the neighborhood just driving in and knowing to park down there and find I mean, this is they've been in this area if this is if this was the path or moving around up in the other area there's just too many examples here of you know i i think one of the things people have to always remember is that um you know we look at so many cases and i think what i see a lot of times is and maybe it's because we watch a lot of tv 
we overcomplicate things. We, we, we create five extra jumps and a twist that doesn't need to be there. And evidence typically, if you'll let it, will flow just like water where it's supposed to be. Now, if there's a reason to move it, that's, that's understandable. I think as you're into an investigation, you may have to pick it up and say, wait a minute, we need to add this because the evidence has brought us to this point. But I think where people get in trouble and the public does this a lot. We, we all do it if we're not careful. And that is we, we create this kind of idea in our head of what we think it is. And now we're trying to shift things to make it fit. And the reality is, you know, I, I noticed earlier you had people asking about, you know, well, maybe he was hiding in the house. You know, anything's possible. But here's the question. It doesn't sound like, at least from what we hear, that there was any kind of forced entry. Right. So if there's not a forced entry, then he has he knows how to get in or he's gotten in without needing that. Why why raise his risk level of being caught in the house by hanging out in there and having to hide in there somewhere if his you know if he's going in that night to do something later on, he drops his risk level by waiting till the right time when they're asleep and then going. It, you know, those are just ways. I'm not saying that he couldn't have waited in there, but why do we add those extra dynamics sometimes? Um, sometimes it makes the story a lot more sensational, but it, there's there's not a reason for that. Um, the other question thing I would just throw out, I think um, Greg was talking a lot about the uh, victimology and consistently what we see across the country in cases is what we would call narrow and shallow victimologies. And that comes from two things. One, I think it's because a lot of time isn't spent really looking at the victims as much as should be. Um, and the second reason is, is because it's, it's uh, one dimensional, it's single source. Um, you cannot get a good victimology on anybody from another person. It, it takes multiple people. You know, if we all think about our own lives, if somebody really wanted to know who I was, we need to sit and talk about all the people you need to talk to to get, get to that answer. And I think a lot of times, so in a community like this, people that you know knew that, the kinds of things that can really be helpful to, to uh, I think, law enforcement is helping to expand those victimologies out there to really help people understand who these people were on multiple levels because now we get we start to expand what Greg was talking about earlier, and that is those unique points where paths could have crossed, right? Where where they would have come in contact with somebody, how that could have happened. So, just some thoughts. No, great insight, Greg. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think it's, um, it, and of course, the investigation is is most likely pursued all this, and that is to try to determine any types of behaviors um, that previously uh, to the time that this, this crime was committed, criminal behavior in that area, in the city, uh, as it relates to voyeurs, um, assaults, attempted, uh, attempted assaults. You know, we don't know I guess the, they, they have come out with a statement that there was no sexual assault involved in this. Right. Now, that does not mean that this was not also potentially sexually motivated. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, it just uh, means that they were not successful in sexually assaulting. And, and, that's welcome, and, and break that down real fast to help the audience understand why that's critical in terms of the choice of a knife and also the fantasy process and how much pre-planning uh, and surveillance potentially could have taken, taken place here. Uh, or, and then offset that to, you know, the spontaneity type of event here, like, you know, Ted Bundy going in the sorority house, you know, in Florida, you know, the, you know, contrast of those two processes. Um, oftentimes we'll find uh, a situation where there was no sexual assault, but 
it doesn't mean it wasn't motivated by sexual interest. Um, and how do we know that? Well, what may appear to lack uh, an assault in that area may be because um, a diversion of focus and, and concentration, for example. Something happened. It could be the way in which a victim may have responded. It could be the presence of somebody that was there that was unexpected, uh, that was not planned for. Uh, and, and that's a possibility in this case. Uh, that would have made it more difficult to satisfy any potential sexual fantasy if there was one. Um, and the, the presence of that particular type of knife, oftentimes we see sexual homicides that are committed, uh, probably I would say most often, with the presence, the utility um, and the affliction of, uh, uh, of a knife. And that seems to be that more up close personal type of weapon. That and strangulation is another one. Uh, ligature strangulation is another one. But in terms of sharp edged instruments, uh, it seems to be a very common uh, weapon that's utilized, uh, particularly when it's sexually motivated. And there's all kinds of theories as to what that what that knife represents, uh, whether it's a projection um, of uh, phallus. sexual, yeah, phallus is example, exactly. Um, and, and that's certainly possible. But, but a knife is also intimate and not, not just sexually intimate, but it creates in the mind of the victim a significant amount of terror and fear. Um, I think most of us have uh, an affinity toward the thought of being stabbed or cut in a significant way. Any of us who've, who've been cut and have had uh, to go through that process of being stitched, etc., cetera, um, it's, it can be a pretty harrowing experience. Um, but it is very personal that the offender has the ability to see the response um, in the victim's eyes and to, to see how they'll react to the presence of a knife, whether it be used for uh, a threat or whether it be used to inflict, uh, to be able to see the reaction and the response, uh, both in the expression of the victim um, and the way in which the, the victim may react physically to it. Um, this is a, an opportunity for the, the offender to visually and psychologically experience a level of control, um, domination and power over another human being that is pretty well unmatched um, with the exception of possibly uh, strangulation because that too is very personal and, and uh, up close. But there is a, a sadistic element to the utility of a knife and, and the infliction of that knife into uh, piercing into uh, the space of, of a victim. And it can be very, very gratifying for those offenders who have a proclivity toward that, particularly who have a, a sadistic sense of pleasure from it. Um, and a, an ultimate level of a need for power, control, and domination over another human being. Yeah, more shock value, uh, as Jim yeah. says, too. It's a great yeah. point. Okay, so I'm going to grab some of these up here real fast. Uh, and everybody, thank you for your patience uh, as we've been going along here. I just want to recognize the folks that uh, have come in. Thank you so much, Patty, uh, Aussie, <laughs> down under. Love it. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Tom, what is the mindset of the perp now? Thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think the mindset of an individual who commits a crime like this is to sit back and watch, to see the response, to gloat, 
in the response of the community of the law enforcement. Uh, and there's a, a certain level of satisfaction because it's, it's an extension of that power, domination and control from the victim now, now an extension of further victimization to the community, to law enforcement. Um, and that and the ability to watch what appears to them to be chaos, the creation of chaos, in that it was due to the acts of that particular individual. And there's a level of gratification that can be achieved uh, by the offender in, in doing that. Uh, also, the practical um, gathering of information, intelligence about uh, the status of the case, how far uh, they have gone, what type of uh, potential, potentially people of interest, uh, what types of evidence that uh, may come out um, that can be uh, very significant to the offender in trying to prepare uh, reaction and response to that intervention that they're ever identified as, as a suspect or person of interest. So here's a question about the average amount length of time. If if you, either one of you want to take a, a shot at that, I mean every case every, every case yeah. is absolutely one hundred percent different. Yeah, and there really are, there is no reasonable length of time. In fact, sometimes the longer it takes, the stronger the case gets. Yeah. Um, you know, it, yeah, it, it yeah. depends on the case. It really does. It's it depends how much evidence there is, you know, uh, what's going on in the life of, of uh, the offender, what's going on in the life of the victim, and how quickly all those all those things come together for the investigator. So Marlena says, so someone could have done this just for the pleasure of using actual knife. That's crazy. Thank you all for your expertise. Thank you so much for supporting us and being here. Uh, we appreciate that. Chapsticks. What a uh, chapstick. What about the animal mutilation re recently reported? That is a really interesting thought. Greg, Dean. I, I, I would not ignore that. I would not ignore that at all. Uh, I would look at that very closely or any other potential assaults or threatening and intimidating types of behaviors towards, uh, towards, women uh, young ladies in this case uh, yeah there was a there was a report of some gals on campus yeah you're oh. and, and this struck me too and I'm gonna just tell you here uh, so um, the gals on campus about let me ask Mike Karen about two weeks before the report of the guy on, the, on bike anyway there was a there was an incident where some girls were walking on campus and this guy was riding his bike and apparently there was an exchange of words and the guy basically pulls a knife and says, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'll basically kill you. <laughs> okay. So one of those things. Well, um, it's pretty significant behavior. Yeah. That's a red flag, right? I yeah. mean, that's yeah. especially. You, can, you, you uh, could consider that as a potentially a precursor types of behavior. Yeah. Interesting. Arsons as well. Yeah. So right. you got, yeah, if you talk about yeah. the, the homicidal triad, you know, that arson and cruelty to animals is certainly seem to be part, partial to individuals that commit violence uh, and particularly sexual violence. So that girl asked, why would Ellie release info that the crime scene was sloppy? Any thoughts on that? I, I think I it was probably because of the amount of blood. And, yeah, that's you know, probably what they're referring to. Yeah, it's, it's cast maybe, off. Maybe it's messy or something, yeah. Yeah, maybe that was a poor choice of words by them, but uh, uh, I, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, great, great question, though, uh, that girl. I, I think they're talking about the cast off and a couple other things. Do we think the offender is still uh, local or fled? Why do you think Ellie won't release more information? Greg? And I think um, we have a responsibility here to, you know, be responsible, right? To yeah. these, to everybody. You bet. Um, I, I think there's a, a phase of time when it, it would not be surprising that the individual left 
for a period, at least if they were local, that they left for a period of time to get out of the heat uh, and to sit back from afar and watch uh, through media to, to uh, monitor what's going on. There's a high probability <clears throat> we could be in this group watching. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. And this is one of the things we talked about before this <clears throat> program tonight, everybody, uh, just to let you know. Uh, if you are watching, they're coming. <laughs> yeah. Right, Greg? Yeah, that's right. They're coming. Yeah. Um, I think somebody. I think uh, somebody asked um, whether or not uh, the community considered whether or not the community at, at large uh, may be in danger, or has this individual committed a crime before? Or will they commit a similar crime in the future? You know, with an individual who is so committed and determined to commit a crime of this nature, this individual is dangerous and should be considered as such and uh, has the capacity, who's just killed four people, certainly has the capacity to hurt others. Yeah, and, and, and the other night on my program, I told people, oh. you know, you have to lock your doors and you have to be in groups of four or five as friends. Uh, but don't be scared. Be Akamai, as they say in Hawaiian. Be alert. Lower yeah. your risk level. Uh, tell right. them why that's so important, Greg. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what we have found, j just a, as, a, I think, a, a level of precaution and prevention, I encourage the watchers to um, ask themselves three questions and make a determination as to whether or not they fall on a victimology continuum at low, medium, or high risk. Just ask yourself, who am I with? What am I doing? Where am I? And based upon your personal response to those questions, <clears throat> plot yourself on a risk continuum, low risk, medium risk, high risk. And if you are either medium risk or high risk, if you feel or sense that gut feeling of concern with respect to your risk level at either one of those levels, immediately take action and get away from the individual or get out of that particular location or cease doing that kind of activity. Take immediate action and give it no thought about the social graces and consequences that may be offensive to somebody. We're talking about your personal safety. We're not trying to make people feel good about themselves. We're talking about keeping and maintaining your own, own uh, safe safety status. So be concerned more for your safety than you are the feelings of other people. I, I think too, what happens to a lot of people is, is that, you know, something like this happens and a few days or weeks go by and nothing else has happened. So we, we start saying well, it's, it's over. It's, it's not going to happen again. And I think the reality is, is that for the perpetrator, sometimes, you know, they're sitting back going, holy cow, you know, this was big. I know, like, for example, when you look at and study some of the uh, situations with BTK, his first attempt when he tried to grab a woman in a parking lot, he, he was for quite a period of time was scared to death, right, that he was going to get caught and uh, that, you know, so he's laying low. Uh, but they'll quickly go back. Past behavior is a predictor of future behavior. So they'll go back and they'll start cycling this thing back up, looking for, if it's truly a predator, start looking for new people. When he doesn't feel like he's being threatened anymore, um, you know, he's going to go back out looking for a way to find somebody. And so, you know, learning to be vigilant at any time in your life, no matter where you are, um, I know all of us would tell you that, uh, with our families, I mean, we've taught them from day one, you know, to constantly be vigil, not paranoid, but vigil and make quick adjustments when needed. Uh, you know, and I think back what we were talking about earlier, and that is this, this human tendency to project your value system on everybody around you. And you have to understand 
that it just takes one at the table who's not like the others uh, to set yourself in a very vulnerable situation. Yeah. So do you think it's his first victims? Greg? <clears throat> I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think there have, have been uh, incidents in this individual's past of um, anger at the interpersonal level. Um, and it would not surprise me to see that an individual who seems to be so adept at the use of a knife in this situ in circumstances like this, uh, has used it before in some capacity, whether it be uh, just threats and intimidation, uh, up to and including um, uh, a next step of a potential assault or an attempted assault. Um, so I think there's going to be a history with this individual of uh, interpersonal violence and anger, uh, but uh, it's focused and directed and not necessarily not out of control. Hey, Greg, this, uh, G that one you just had up there, I think her name was Jeannie. She asked this question. She said, do you think that um, he would have been rejected by one of the girls? Can you just talk about, they don't need to be rejected by the actual victim but those become substitutes. That concept of the victims being substitutes for other path rejections. Yeah, I think you've just addressed that, Dean. So uh, <laughs> it certainly could be. Uh, that's a possibility. And I, you, of course, you know that they're considering those things. Um, and they may just, in fact, represent uh, a certain type of girl to this individual who, uh, for whatever reason, he is personalized as being rejected. That's certainly possible. Uh, and they, they may just represent that kind of person, or it may, they may have crossed paths and, uh, he, re he decided to, um, uh, perceive it in a way that was not intended and for whatever reason, identified them as potential victims. Those are possibilities, certainly possibilities. So here's a question. It's another loaded one, but I think it's important. I think an individual who can commit a crime to this level uh, and with such sustained aggression so successfully is... Uh, at risk of committing more crimes in the future. Okay. Here's the next one. Uh, I'm so confused as to why there wasn't a blood trail by the suspect. I assume he was prepared and took off his shoes, et cetera, kept his exit clean. Is there such a thing? You know, the blood is, blood is a, one of these days we should have, you know, our Karen from the CCF up here or Kathy to sure. talk, to talk about blood spatter analysis and <clears throat> yeah. how, how tricky it can be. I mean, everybody, you know, there's not always a, unfortunately it's, it's just weird sometimes. I mean, and you just don't know. You just don't know if the suspect gets it on them. In this case, because there are four victims, there's a high probability that, yeah, there is a, you know, a transfer of some sort onto the suspect, maybe onto his shoes because he's going from scene to scene, yeah. uh, you know, that kind of problem. Uh, and then you're right. You would expect to see some type of blood trail potentially going out into, if it's snowing into the snow, or something, but then you know. Remember the the call came in uh, hours later, so the crime, the estimate of the crime was what three a.m. to six a.m. Um, and so, you know that that means weather can also play a factor here. It was icy uh, snow. Uh, it could have covered up, you know, the the blood trail if there, you know, if it existed. 
just like it could have covered up that 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 uh, glove uh, out front. You know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other factors that are just unknowns, and that's why these types of cases are so complicated because there isn't just one thing that fits into the box. You always have to think outside of the box. Uh, and that's how you actually discover things. Uh, and after the crime, does the killer's mental state go through different stages? If so, Greg, what are they? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. They do go through different stages. Um, first of all, you know that uh, they are filled with a, a certain amount of uh, emotion uh, and adrenaline, uh, having just successfully in the mind of the offender successfully committed this crime. So there's a, a potential high that they're experiencing because of that level of success, power and domination over another human being. And at the same time, there's a, a level of fear uh, and concern about getting caught. Uh, and that's why the more time that they spend in preparation and in, pl in the planning phase for committing a crime, particularly like this, the more that they can control those emotions afterwards in terms of their fear level uh, of getting caught um, from a forensic perspective or being seen by somebody. So that post-defense behavior is all about now uh, getting rid of forensic evidence, um, delaying any potential uh, connection to the victims and or the crime scene. And so they're gonna spend a lot of time decombusting, if you will, watching the news very closely, uh, whether it be locally or whether it be from afar, if they left the area, which is a, a good possibility that they left the area, um, at least for a period of time, that's very common for obvious reasons um, until and the, the longer they watch and that they're not being identified or approached by law enforcement, the more confidence begins now to build back up. Um, you know, th this type of a crime can create for certain types of offenders. This it's a thrill kind of a seeking crime as well, because this, this level of success and the, the power that they experience. Um, but at the same time, you've got the, the opposite of that is this very significant level of fear of being identified, apprehended. So, so very vigilant, watching it very keenly and vigilantly uh, with the expectation that within time, the longer this thing goes without being identified or even being approached, uh, their, their confidence level is building back up and moving back toward some level of uh, kind of balance in their lives again. Yeah, and he could get he could be getting a charge out of it. Absolutely. Right now, I mean, he's on he's on the build, right? Yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah, he's on the build yeah. again. Why would he attack sleeping victims if he wants to see their response? That's an interesting. Um, question. Yeah, and, and we're not saying in this particular case that he did want to see their response. We're just saying that an individual that uses a knife oftentimes allows them to do that for that particular pr purpose. It, it, it's another level of gratification for a particular type of offender. We're not saying that this particular offender falls in that category. Uh, why would you attack a sleeping victim? That is because of lack, a, a level of lack of confidence. Uh, as an example, because it increases the potential of success for the offender and decreases the survivability of the victim. Um, well, and and there's, there's no personal interaction between the victim and the offender, which in, in this case, the, it's apparent that the offender wants no interaction with these victims. Yeah, interesting. Uh, boy, I've got a ton of things here, Greg. Uh, I'm going to have to put some of these up. Do you think he kept the knife? Um, what we have found in many, many other cases similar to these kinds of things is they do often 
keep the knife because it represents a number of things to them. From a practical perspective, he brought it with him. And now from uh, potentially a, a souvenir aspect or uh, consideration, uh, something that will allow them to remember. Okay. Um, let's see. Could you explain the wounds upper versus lower? Uh, without them defining those, I could I can't explain that. Without the an accurate description of where those wounds were located. Okay. Um, Typically, upper upper could be chest, lower could be stomach. So, Miss, if I ask if he's a self cutter, could he expand to cutting others, meaning if there's a you know, that's usually a cry for help individuals yeah. who are cutting themselves. Uh, so I have not seen that in my career. Mm -hmm. um, any of you guys? No, no. I, I haven't. Okay. Uh, here's a good one. Could the young man have been the target? That, that certainly it's possible, but without knowing the nature of the wounds it's and other behavior, particularly post-defense behavior, difficult to say that without specific information. It's hard to make that conjecture. A humble reminder, these are real people, real families who are hurting. Yeah, absolutely. Go hug your loved ones. That Most is important. Sure. And, and, that, and I can tell you from firsthand experience who's lost a son. I know exactly where these parents are. My son was 20 years old when he passed away. Those of you who are new to the TIR family, those that know me, uh, I, they're in a place that nobody, nobody understands unless you've been in that house in terms of that world right there. Uh, have you had any success working with canine in some cases like this? Um, man, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with everybody. Thank you so much. Um, you guys are all so kind tonight. This is cool about these kids and I'm trying to keep um, lead to location. Yeah. Canine units could be very effective mm -hmm. uh, if they're brought in early right away. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, it depends upon what kind of dogs we're talking about also. I mean, you know, and so you have cadaver dogs, you have search dogs, you have, you know, there's all kinds of different, the dogs are trained for different types of things in this case, you would be looking for, you'd have some kind of a scent to know that it was the person, the perpetrator, right, to be able to put a dog to track on that. So I'm not sure I've seen that as much uh, unless they had something. I mean, we've not heard of anything from the scene. It may be that there is something there, but nothing that, you know, has come out publicly, at least, that would give you an indicator that they have a source to be able to utilize with dogs. So if this cartel related to the young lady's mom, um, you know, I don't think we know that um, personally. I don't have knowledge of that. Uh, I think if it was, you know, they're not going to hit it like this. I mean, it's going to be a little bit different. I've actually worked some of those cases, you know, coming from the border in Southern California and they usually just put a 22 to the back of somebody's head. And the, and if they do, then they want to make sure that the neighborhood that uh, had that problem with them is aware of it uh, because it's more of a message killing, a throw killing, not necessarily something like this where this is a an attack. And, and what I mean by that kind of differentiating, you know, it's not that, you know, the cartel comes in and says, you know, we're going to take care of your daughter. Uh, you know, and therefore we're going to take care of everybody else around her. They don't usually operate like that. But you know what? I've been proven wrong too in the past, so who knows? Uh, but well, I think I'm, we all, I think I'm, all of us, I was just going to say, I think all of us would agree that in a lot of these cases where, you know, we've seen things that have been out in the public domain. Uh, once you get access to the actual case files and are able to see all of the evidence, sometimes things do take on a whole different perspective. And I think that's what Greg's been alluding to is that, you know, a lot of the things to get specific on are very difficult because we don't, we've, 
we've not seen the crime scene. We've not seen the victims. We don't know. Uh, so it, it leaves that open. We could talk at a 30,000 foot level of, you know, some ideas and concepts. We can talk about other cases that, you know, have some similarities to them. Uh, but to, to get down into some of the more specific things without more information, it makes it very difficult. Yeah, police should not ex, uh, explain uh, a four-hour time gap in X and East timeline. Is that significant? Uh, it could be, absolutely. They could have uh, some information such as surveillance of, of those two uh, that you know they can see some things in there that would be crucial. Uh, to the flow of, ins of the investigation. Always remember, uh, guys, that these things are like living documents. An investigation is like a living document. It is fluid. It is constantly changing, and it can be adapted uh, to any type of um, additional information that comes in. There's no, I've, I've never, and Greg, I mean, and, and Dean, how many times have we been going down a road and then all of a sudden it's like, boom. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it can change from hour to hour. It can change yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. And so we don't want to get stuck in anything, but I certainly do love this, this, these questions because it does make us think outside of the box. Uh, and that's how this, that's how this perpetrator will be caught because people are thinking out of the box. Um, I'd say, Chris, and I, I just as a cautionary to people, because I think we've seen this as well, and that is, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the conversation about what if and I wonder and all of those things. But it's been brought up already. We're, we're talking about real people, real families. And I think one of the dangers sometimes with some of the um, especially extreme um, hypotheses that come out there it can send people down a path and then innocent people uh, get sucked into that. And I think we've all seen cases where family members or individuals <laughs> because people are so, they want to get the answer so badly that they're not realizing that uh, these are real people. And I think what keeps, you know, we talk about a lot at the foundation, what, what, what keeps us doing what we do are, are the victims and their families. Uh, because these people, at the end of the day, when all the dust settles and all the answers are brought in, uh, their life is now on a different trajectory. And I think keeping that kind of balance in mind as people speculate sometimes just to be careful that uh, they not get carried away with that, because we are dealing with some some real people and, and uh, potentially real circumstances in people's lives. I know you pointed that out even with some of the businesses that you were talking about, you know, because somebody's name comes up in relationship to something doesn't mean, you know, that uh, people need to go down a path to all of a sudden pull them into it. So. Yeah. So Mimi asked, uh, uh, and I, by the way, I have about 25 questions lined up. So we've, mm. we're going to have you know shorter answers. <laughs> Would this be the type of offender that cares that everybody's what they're saying about them? Um, I think so. I think he's getting off yeah. on this. Yeah, and he's, he also wants to monitor what what people are saying, what the status of the investigation is, and uh, that allows him an extension of of that level of influence and power. Uh, do you think he'll strike again? He's not stopped. Uh, it's certainly possible. So there was a dog at the house uh, that didn't bark or didn't do anything. Uh, does that raise your uh, curiosity in any way? Well, I don't know. We don't know what kind of dog it is. We don't know uh, what the personality of the dog is. Um, it, it does beg the question, um, Would is the dog a barker? Is the dog um, very reactive to strangers, not reactive to strangers? Very friendly to strangers, or uh, or vice versa. Would he would he react to a stranger, or she? I don't know what kind of dog it is, or, or what the. Jeanine says, could this guy be rejected by more than one girl, one of the girls? Possible. 
certainly, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, is any of these things are possible and uh, without having all the information available to us, it's hard to come up with a probable hypothesis. And, and we wouldn't want to get too heavily involved in that anyway, based upon the status of the investigation. Yeah. So th this is a good one. Either one of you can grab that one. ROTCs, would that help in planning escape, et cetera? Well, I think uh, whether it be something like that or um, any type of, of background and experience that would lend one to uh, that kind of activity, what could be hunting, it could be a, a hobby for that matter. It wouldn't have to necessarily be a profession. But any kind of activity, professional or personal, uh, that would be consistent with with the way and the manner in which the crime was being committed. Yeah, uh, and Holly says it's a love doodle. So, yeah, those mm -hmm. little dogs are so cute, oh. and they're they're his name is Murphy, and oh, okay. they're just you know he just looks like the most adorable thing, and uh, I don't see him parking at anybody. Unfortunately, you know, Chris, I think a counter to the ROTC concept as well, though, is, is that along with that type of training, ROTC also, they tend to learn a lot in regards to character, integrity, and a lot of other training goes into that as well. So it's not impossible, but I think you always have to keep in mind, it's easy to say, well, they got this specialized training, but they're getting other training as well and leadership and different things. So, you know, it might be somebody who's a fluke within a system, but for the most part, you kind of have to give everything the same weight, right? As you're looking at evidence, give it, don't, don't overweight one thing over the other. So I don't think we have this information, Jade. That is a great question, but I don't have that information. Um, so that would be definitely, I'm sure the authorities are, questioning those individuals closely because they had access to the house. Uh, here's one for you from Phil. Uh, Greg, I mean, it's almost like this is old homeschool week for you right there when you look at these names, right? <laughs> yeah, those are the, the great names from my perspective. Um, I didn't have much uh, association with uh, Robert Ressler. He, in fact, he retired three weeks after I arrived at the academy as, as a new profiler. So I was in training just as he was retiring. And uh, so I only was able to associate with him for a, a brief time. But John Douglas and Roy Hazelwood, uh, the best in the business. Roy is no longer with us. Uh, but uh, he was the preeminent instructor uh, at the National Academy, from my perspective. He was also the expert in uh, serial rapists and an excellent profiler. And Here's of course, a John, John Douglas is, our, is the main man of profiling, from my perspective. And he, he is also the uh, emeritus here at the Cold Case Foundation. Yeah, he was our chair, chairman of the board. He was our first chairman yeah. of the board. Yeah. So this is, a, the you know, Greg and, uh, and Dean and myself, you know, we're part of the Cold Case Foundation, and that's why I'm wearing my swag tonight. You know, as you told yeah, me. all of us are. There we go. We're all there wearing we our swag <laughs> with my TIR shirt, which, you know, I've got both plates going here. Uh uh, do you, this, I like this question. Do you think he'll be at the candle, uh, visual? So they're having a candle visual Thursday night. Are they? Yeah. On campus. Yeah. Very, uh, very interesting. And, and, uh, I would say that, um, without directly answering that, I would, I would say that, uh, the individuals to whatever degree that are involved in this, will do whatever they can to acquire information uh, and monitor. Uh, so there may be all kinds of potential activities that are involved. 
Interesting. Will he insert himself? Yeah. Well, that's why the glove that's was kind of a red flag <laughs> yeah. for me, right? Did yeah, he come back yeah. and is he taunting him? Is he yeah. taunting? Exactly. Um, any in response to that question, any anything they can do to, to monitor the investigation and live it out. Uh, could he have stayed longer in the house to clean up since hours passed prior to the 911 call? No one known about how long he was in there. That is possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's always possible. We, yeah. you know, hopefully the authorities, uh, well, they know. They know. They know. They know. They know. Yeah, they know. Uh, you, to take something from the scene, sort of a trophy, because it's a targeted event. Thanks, Tim. Would you? Well, you would, would you, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, we, we certainly know that uh, in cases uh, that there have been numerous cases where the purple will take uh, trophies or souvenirs. But keep in mind uh, that he has one particular one uh, that he brought with him and he, he left with and also left with it. I think one of the things too is, is remember that it's, you know, things are things that can be very important to the perpetrator or the offender that we may not initially understand why it's that important. It's important to them behaviorally or things they may take. Um, the beautiful thing about the work that has been done by many before us and work that the foundation still does is we're continuing to reach out and work with uh, incarcerated offenders. So what that does is helps us, you know, after the fact, begin to understand things. And so we can look back and say, okay, well, that, that did, that, that was a trophy and there was a significance of it to that person. So sometimes when we're looking at it initially, it may not always, but it did have significance to them, I think so, is another way. So 99 balloons, I love 99 balloons. You see, you know who that picture is or avatar? or his avatar, whoever this person is, mm -hmm. whoever you are, I absolutely love you. That's Leticia Hernandez. December oh, 16th. Right? Yeah, December 16th, 1989. Wow. Uh, Near and dear to your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how cool is that? Man, Sorry. man, oh, man. Uh, let's see here. If this was pre-planned and methodically organized as so far as the evaded capture, uh, could he have warned PPE to avoid any trace evidence left behind? Personal protective equipment. Sure. Could have. Yeah, he would. Sure. He could. He could have a kit. Absolutely. He could have a kit, but we, you know, we're not going to know that yet. Uh, there's one. Greg. Most likely. Yeah, talk you know? uh, while I'm getting the next one up. Yeah, we do know up? we we do know that these individuals will will often uh, idolize. In fact, uh, Danny Rollins. So the, 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 yeah, the celebrity of, of particular cases. Go ahead, tell them about Danny Rollins. Well, yeah. I was going to have you. That's and you worked that one, right? Danny Rollins out of uh, that well, was no, I, I I was just uh, it happened right after I. I uh, was assigned as a profiler, but no, I did not work it personally. I only was aware of it. And, okay. uh, so there were, I was in training, so to speak, during that period of time. And, and I think it was, um, I think it was Roy, Roy Hazelwood and Jim Wright that went out and worked that case. Yeah, that was, uh, that was in 1990. And he, uh, he murdered five students uh, at Santa Fe College uh, and then four at the University Gainesville. of yeah, in Florida, uh, the University of Florida. So any consideration about whether the perpetrator was a gamer going room to room? You know, we, we had some discussion about this a few weeks ago, Chris, uh, about the, what, the metaverse, right? Yes, we did. And um, to the degree that people can go out and live out their fantasies, in a virtual reality setting, um, is goes back to this issue of practice again, doesn't it? Practice. Yes. Practice. It, we've heard the comment, "Practice makes perfect." Well, it's not it's not really practice makes perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. 
And the more an individual can practice these things, uh, whether it be virtually or whether it just be uh, in their own mind uh, through fantasy, the chances are that they, they will improve uh, in that the methods that they use and the, the ultimate performance that they seek. So Miss, Missify says, grad after party, slept on couch, drug drink, you know, drug drinks, shower, dress in Ethan's clothes and shoes, girls oversized sweats. Okay. Uh, I don't quite understand that. Um, you know, where that's suggesting, coming is he yeah. su suggesting that he's may have used other people's clothes there in the home to okay. cover possibility? Do you believe two uh, perp had two knives? Do you think screaming will alert the house? Um, you know, again, that's going to be the significance of the wound patterns yeah. because if he attacked the upper torso and potentially the neck, they may not have had an opportunity. I, I want to be sensitive to the family too at the same time while yeah. not being too graphic, right? Yeah. Uh, and thank you. <laughs> yes, I love it. Uh, let's see. Something tells me the spree killing out of desperation and get out of that house success successfully. Uh, took care of the upstairs, came down, confronted, no choice, and um, Ethan has had the wounds. And and you think he ca he went up to the third floor too, Greg? Don't you? Yeah. And worked his way down. Yeah, I, I think most likely, but we just don't know because we don't have all that detail in the crime scene. Yeah, this one here, hot mess. It's like he would want a public attention. Yeah, he, he is. He's wanting it. Oh, well, he's got plenty of attention. Yeah. He's having plenty of it. Yeah, that's okay. I'm just getting through here. I'm starting to catch up. Starting to catch up. Not one there. What do you think of that? Would suspect and concern hiding face since he knew he was going to uh, basically unhurt or kill everybody? Um, he's also concerned about when he leaves. He doesn't want to see anybody outside seeing him in terms of his effort to escape. So while he may not have been concerned about the victims being able to identify him, um, most likely he's concerned when he leaves the, the house, running into somebody that could have seen it. Okay. We are two hours. Wow. Whoa. That's a lot. That's a lot of time. And did we put anybody to sleep? Uh, ho hopefully not. However, here's the word. You, Greg, you get the last word. As always, and uh, I get so, the last one. <laughs> yeah, you do. I've had way too many words tonight. Man, oh man, oh man! <laughs> but then, when you're done, we're going to go to Hawaii. Dean, do you have anything uh, you want to add tonight? And everybody, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, man, this just flew by. This thing was just happening so fast. Um, and of course, you know, Dean and Greg will always come back because you know we work together. So. <laughs> that ain't gonna go anywhere, and uh, we can get you get them back on here anytime we want. Uh, so we appreciate both of you this evening, and everybody that's been here for your support. You help us continue to move along. Go over to Cold Case Foundation. Uh, we're a five hundred one c three over there. Uh, we got eight thousand people here still. Hit up the um, Cold Case Live. Uh, you know. Uh, sign up for that, please. It helps support uh, us to help other agencies. And you'll see why here in a couple of days uh, with some things that we've been involved in. Uh, we can't talk about them right now tonight, but you'll see it uh, in the next couple of days, four or five days, whatever it's going to be. Uh, we sure appreciate each and every one of you. Please share this with everybody. If you have not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe to this channel uh, that we give everybody an opportunity to weigh in uh, on whatever they're, you know, they're thinking. We just ask that you be 
constantly, you know, classy and uh, not, you know, mean or hurtful. There's enough of that out there. We don't need to, we want, we need to take up, you know, a little kinder approach to one another sometimes. And, um, you know, there's, there's enough evil out there. We don't need to add to it here on the TIR uh, family show. Uh, We sure love you. Aloha, as they say in Hawaii. And thank you so much, uh, Arkansas. We sure appreciate you very much. You've been with us from the very beginning. Thank you to our mods. Uh, I can, the list will go on uh, for everybody. We're, we're just so grateful for everybody. So uh, that said, Greg or Dean, what do well, you just thank you. Thank you, everybody, for... Uh, no, no, not yet, mister. I, oh. You're trying to take Dean's thunder. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dean. Go ahead. Nice try. Well, Dean. Well, well Dean, seconds. you take it. You take it and finish seconds. it. And then we're going to... we're gonna. Oh, you want him to have it? Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, you can give it to Dean. Give okay, Dean. so, <laughs> Dean, you're going to have the last word, so Coop and I are pulling out, and then we're going to go to Hawaii. Uh, yeah, we'll see you, Dean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well thanks. Chris wait, for letting wait a minute, Dean. Wait a minute. You're you're yeah. getting me, bro. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for letting us come on board, and uh, we really have enjoyed being with you. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight and uh, continue to support these guys in law enforcement that are working this case. These guys are putting in tremendous hours. Uh, they need your support and uh uh, give them benefit of the doubt every chance you get. And so uh, thanks again. You guys have a great evening. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out 24 seven, babe. No, no time outs. Wish we could fly away. You and I. Go to our favorite place Oh yeah, yeah Make special memories Together I'll be your company Now and forever I say we fly away You and me Go to our favorite place Feeling the sun on my face in a while Facing away